Jeremiah, I don't need to reintroduce the book, one of the major prophets of the Old Testament, not just because he's classified among the five major prophets, but of prophetical books, but uh, because he is one of the spiritual highs in the Old, in the Old Testament. And uh, we're, we, uh, we are at chapter 33. We took a verse or two last time, but that was just sort of a teaser. We'll get into chapter 33 tonight, which concludes a three-chapter division of the book, sometimes called the Book of Consolation. And uh, so chapter 33 fits with 31 and 32 as a special message to console them. It's a special unit uh, in the minds of most of the scholars. Chapter 33, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time, while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying... Now, you recall he was in the court of the prison. Zedekiah was um, facing the Babylonian siege. Uh, Not Zedekiah so much. Uh, We're going to discover in the subsequent chapters, too, Zedekiah is sort of a double-minded man. And uh, Scripture tells us that that he's unstable in all his ways, thus. But he sort of likes Jeremiah, but his court uh, advisors are very anti-Jeremiah for lots of reasons. Jeremiah's message is pro-Babylon in the sense that he points out that God has raised up the Babylonians to be his instrument of judgment and that they will prevail. Most of Zedekiah's advisors were pro-Egypt, and they keep intriguing in the hopes that Egypt will be a a strong enough ally to somehow fend off the Babylonians. And Jeremiah predicts that that isn't going to work, and of course he's right. But uh, So from time to time he's uh, attacked by the court leadership, and Zedekiah occasionally will protect him, sometimes seek his counsel, and other times, in this case, put him in prison. Now, it's, it's, he's in the court of the prison, which implies that he's technically under house arrest, but he, at the same time, he's not in a dungeon or something. At this particular time, he's, he's in just in some kind of confinement. But in any case, God comes, the word of the Lord comes to him while he's yet uh, shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker of it, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. And then we have verse 3, which I commended to you last time as a potential uh, a candidate for your Bible memory list, if you keep such a thing. And I encourage you to do that many, many times. If you've hidden the word of the Lord in your heart, uh, no one can take that away from you, and it'll avail itself to you at times when you don't have time to dig up your book or dig out a concordance. So those of you that have a leaning towards uh, Scripture memory, I encourage you to include Jeremiah 33.3. Those of you that don't do that, I encourage you to give it a try. And uh, because uh, Jeremiah, I guess, says, thy words are found and I did eat them, right? And uh, actually, uh, many of the verses that I find uh, I've treasured the most, I didn't really understand, understand until after I had memorized them. Certain prophecies particularly that I was intrigued with, committed them to memory, just as a little... I was on a kick in those days. And as I did that, I discovered, as I really thought about it, it said something quite different than I first had perceived. In any case, Jeremiah 33 3 is just one of those neat promises. It's fun to catalog and index and absorb um, God's promises. He makes all kinds of promises. We're going to talk about a very special kind of promise later tonight a covenant. How many of you have been in the service? You ever hear you're having uh, get your uh, cut new orders? You heard that expression? Get my orders cut? Do you know why it's called cut? You don't know, do you? I used to think it was because of mimeograph uh, stencil. That's not it at all. I used to think that was one of you. you like you know, they sometimes said you cut a stencil, and you you make fifty copies, and then you use them for uh, as authorities in various preparations. You're going to discover uh, possibly that that goes back to uh, Genesis 15. We'll come to that later tonight. I just tease you with that so you won't leave before we get to. Okay, uh, <coughs> Genesis. Uh, correction. Jeremiah 33:3. Great promise. Call unto me, and I will answer thee. Comma. Now, that's enough. What a neat promise. You call upon the Lord, and he promises to answer you. And show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I love that verse. I uh, committed that to my little list of things years ago. And I've discovered, too, in my life, I've had a very adventurous life. God has blessed me with the most incredible adventures. And uh, I've done almost everything you can imagine to do. But the greatest excitement I've had of, of all the things that have bring, brought me joy and excitement, I think the joy of discovery is the greatest of those. To uncover something 
some treasure, unexpected, is the most fun thing I've done. And none are greater than discovering something the Lord just has specially for you, tucked away in the scripture, and he brings it out with a totally unanticipated result. Very, a, lot, a lot of fun. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. Now, he doesn't give you the kind of discoveries I've given you that are trivial and incidental, okay? He gives you great and mighty things, of which thou knowest not. Verse 4. For thus saith the Lord, uh, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of the city, and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down by the siege mounds and by the sword. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men, whom I have slain in mine anger and my fury, and because of all whose wickedness I have hidden my of all whose wickedness I have hidden my face from this city. Behold, I'll bring it health and cure, and will cure them, and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth, and I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first. Interesting thing here, he has a promise of returning, not just Judah. Now, Judah is about to be enslaved and taken captive. But um, when he says, I'm going to uh, 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 cause the captivity re to return, that is, he's going to undo it. He also speaks of the captivity of Israel. That's something that we easily lose sight of. You'll hear all kinds of things about the ten lost tribes of Israel. There's are nothing lost about them at all. God knows where they are. Um, Israel, and here it's used denotatively as the northern kingdom, Judah being the southern kingdom after the, the division of the nation Israel in the, in the days of Jeroboam and Rehoboam. The northern kingdom uh, denotatively called Israel, and the southern kingdom called Judah. Because the northern kingdom was consisting essentially of ten tribal areas, you'll hear them spoken of as the ten tribes. And the Judah and, and Simeon, actually in part of Benjamin, are the southern kingdom of Judah. And you hear that you think of twelve tribes, two in the south and ten in the north. That that's a very naive uh, notion, because first of all, there's thirteen tribes, not twelve. Remember Levi. But also, as the northern kingdom went into idolatry, the faithful of the northern kingdom migrated south. And uh, ultimately, because the northern kingdom did not repent of its idolatry, it was taken enslaved by Assyria, some hundred years prior to the writing of Jeremiah. Now, the Assyrians were subsequently conquered by the Babylonians. When the Babylonians uh, conquered the, the holdings of, the Assyri of Assyria, they inherited, obviously, their captives. And when uh, Babylon ultimately uh, prevails over the southern kingdom of Judah, which is not just two tribes, it's a mixture of some of the faithful from the northern tribes too, but when they finally um, uh, fail to repent as a nation, a, a southern kingdom, then uh, the Babylonians take them into slavery, and they become uh, commingled with the slaves that are set by Nebuchadnezzar. So the, the concept of ten lost tribes is a little naive. But what's interesting here is we have the promise that both Judah and Israel will be uh, returned. Verse 8, And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, and by which they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities in which they have sinned, and in which they have transgressed against me. That's a, prof you know, a, a prophecy yet future. And it shall come, and it shall be to me a name of joy, a a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth who shall hear all the good that I do unto them and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness that I have uh, and, and for all of the prosperity that I procure unto it. This kind of message of encouragement right in the middle of all this judgment is one reason these three chapters are called the book of consolation. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a message of encouragement. Verse 10. Thus saith the Lord, again there shall be heard in this place which ye say shall be desolate, without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the voice of them who shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever, and of those who shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause to return the captive of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. Incidentally, this goes on, but just to incidentally mark, um, the uh, verse 11 is the, apparently the closing part of a benediction that's used in Jewish marriages even today, I understand, from uh, authority. 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, again this place which is desolate, without man, without beast, and all its cities shall be a habitation of shepherds, uh, causing their flocks to lie down. In the cities of the mountains, in the cities of Shephelah, and in the cities of the Negev, and in the land of Benjamin, and in in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, shall the flocks pass again. Uh, under the hands of him that uh, counteth them, saith the Lord. Kind of interesting, by the way, that he mentions Benjamin. Um, That might catch your eye, partly because of the incident we studied last time. Remember the property that was bought in Anathoth? Um, That was in the land of Benjamin. It's here singled out among the others to to, to, uh, made reference to. There's lots of 12 tribes, and obviously Judah and uh, the others are mentioned generically as as the house, but Benjamin is alluded there. It ties ties it, if you will, to the earlier chapter, I think. Now, a small point, not a big deal, but the rest of this chapter happens not to appear in the Septuagint version. And so that causes all kinds of scholars to ponder it. Um, Despite that, there still seems to be substantial authorities that believe it's valid, even though the Septuagint, for some reason, omits verses 14 to the end of the chapter. But uh, most of what's here is also found elsewhere, and it's also uh, the, you know, uh, there's no reason really to disregard it. Um, I just mention that by way of completeness. But anyway, verse 14, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now, this may sound a lot, sound very familiar to you, not the least of which is it sounds like Isaiah. The, one of the titles of Jesus Christ is the branch. In one rendering in the Hebrew, it's netzer, which, upon which there is a pun built in the New Testament. The concept of a Nazarene and the concept of the branch, that is a netzer. It's not obvious in the English, but in the Hebrew there's a, pun, there's a constructive pun involved. But the branch of righteousness is a title of Jesus Christ who shall grow up unto David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness of the land. This is, verse 15, is basically a messianic uh, prophecy. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely, and this is the name by which the city that she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Now here again is this strange phrase, Jehovah Tzitkanu. We encountered it before, if you recall, as a name by which the Lord will be called. And here again, the city is linked to the Lord by both being called by that name. That The, the name of the Lord, uh, his being t- it being tied to Jerusalem, occurs in Ezekiel 48.35. Uh, also, it's tied to his altar in Judges 6.24 and uh, other places. There are examples of this. Oh, one other comment I was going to make. Um, it's um, I've... When we were talking about style and so forth, I mentioned how Jeremiah is so picturesque. And uh, the verse 15 gave rise to a, an excursion here of at least uh, some number of pictures. How many pictures do you suppose you might find in Jeremiah? Seven. Seven. Yeah, very good. Good guess. That's good. Right? There's a dice player there. Okay. Um, springing, spring of living water. We use that phrase, right? That's from Jeremiah. Good shepherd occurs many places. Jeremiah is a righteous branch we've just encountered. Uh, as ti- the title of Jesus as the Redeemer occurs in Jeremiah chapter 50. Um, the Lord our righteousness occurred in chapter 23 earlier, and here again we find in chapter 33. Uh, David the King, a linking of that to, as a messianic title, is in chapter 30. We encountered that. And finally... Um, the agent of the new covenant we encountered in chapter 31. So there's seven uh, images or titles, if you will, of of messianic uh, phrases that Jeremiah indulges in, for those of you that might find that interesting. Okay, verse 17. Thus saith the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. That's quite a statement. David shall never lack a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Well, we, we covered the whole curse on the, the blood curse on Jeconiah. And we went through all of that before. I won't recount that other than just to highlight it to you so you can go back in your notes or dig up the tape. But here's quite a thing. This says, the house of David will never lack a man to sit on the throne of David. Where is that man today? There's only one left. There's only one left, and he's at the throne of God today. Interesting thing. 
David Zion still lives. Now, verse 18, Neither shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings. Well, that's a surprise. You may not realize that the Levitical priesthood is permanent. Now, we're, we're so um, intrigued in the, right, in the book of Hebrews how Jesus Christ is a priest after the Levitical priesthood. No, Melchizedek, good for you. Good for you. Big deal there, and it's, I won't rebuild all of that. I invite you to get the, Hebrews, the tapes on Hebrews if you want to dig into that. But um, <clears throat> there was a promise to Phineas in uh, Numbers 25 that the Levitical priesthood would be forever. And so in our awareness of Jesus Christ as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, we may fail to recognize that the Levitical priesthood, which is a very Jewish thing, will endure uh, uh, forever. And uh, the Levitical priesthood is permanent from that promise. There's a continuing covenant with Levi in Malachi 2.4 and also in Numbers 17. It's not a big deal, so we won't beat it to death, but at least to let you be aware of it, that uh, Levi, the, uh, the Levitical priest, is not just a temporal thing in the sense of the law of Moses. It's There are promises to the house of Levi to endure. And here is another one in verse 18. That neither shall the priest, that is the Levites, lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to kindle meal offerings, and to do sacrifice continually. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if ye break my covenant of the day, and if ye can break my covenant of the night, and that there should be not day and night in their season. Then may also my covenant with, be broken with David, my servant, that he should not have a man to reign upon his throne, and, uh, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. That's a long King James way of saying not to worry. Um, in other words, if you, can break, if you can stop nights and days, then, then indeed you can break the covenant he's made with David. That's just a way of saying you can't do it. Just a colorful, rabbinical, inverted line of reasoning way of expressing that thought, if I may put it that way. Verse 22, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister unto me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Considerest thou not what, the, that, what this people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord hath chosen, he hath even cast them off? Thus they have despised my people, and they should no more uh, be no more a nation before them. Thus saith the Lord, if my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David, my servant, so that uh, I will not take any of his seed to be rulers of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. Okay, that so ends the section of those three chapters, chapters 31, 32, and 33, the so-called Book of Consolation, particularly this last chapter, a fairly straightforward um, passage of encouragement, quite a contrast to the gloom and doom kind of stuff that Jeremiah has been nailing them with in previous chapters, uh, the Book of Consolation, and so ends a major ch section. Now we're going to in enter into, from chapter 34, well, 34 through 38, uh, is going to be um, five chapters that, that uh, essentially uh, cover Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's experiences during the siege of Jerusalem. It's going to be quite a lot of narrative. So it's going to change, more or less biographical, if you will. Chapter 39 will be the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. after a two-year siege. And then uh, chapters 40 through 44 will be the events after the fall. So we've got... Um, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. Five chapters ahead of the fall, the fall, and then uh, five chapters after the fall as, as essentially historically, more or less historical passages that are in the next section. Now, incidentally, those of you that remember the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3 and 4 particularly, you will be aware of the fact that Nebuchadnezzar's reign during that time was very, very widespread, not just a little local fertile crescent kind of thing. And this, this starts to also come before us here in uh, chapter 34. Chapter 34, verse 1, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth and uh, of his, uh, all the kingdoms of the earth of his dominion and all the peoples fought against Jerusalem and against its, all its cities, saying, Thus saith the Lord, 
the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Now, um, this is... uh, uh, there's not a lot of new information here. We're going to um, see the Lord now focus very specifically in, in uh, indicting, if you will, Zedekiah. Let's, uh, let's, but he's going to actually do better than his, the other kings that preceded him who, who were really in bad shape. Actually, he's, Zedekiah is going to do um, uh, not quite so badly. Verse 3, And thou shalt not escape out of his hand, that is out of Nebuchadnezzar's hand, now, Jeremiah is ta- the Lord's telling Jeremiah, talk to Zedekiah. So this is Jeremiah talking to his king. And thou shalt not escape out of his hand, but thou shalt surely be taken and delivered into his hand, and thine eyes shall behold the eyes of the king of Babylon, and he shall speak with thee mouth to mouth, and thou shalt go to Babylon. Now, there's an overtone here that you might miss. One of the things that Zedekiah is going to face, have to face, is to be face to face with the king of Babylon. And the overtone here is that's not too neat a thing. I mean, not only is he going to be taken, he's going to be confronted with Nebuchadnezzar, you know, eyeball to eyeball, navel to navel, face to face. And uh, that's what this gives us a subtle insight into is how much Nebuchadnezzar was feared. Nebuchadnezzar was uh, probably one of the most absolute despots that's ever ruled on the planet Earth. We get glimpses of that here and there in the book of Daniel particularly, when uh, he thought someone didn't perform quite up to snuff, threw him in a, you know, into a fiery furnace. Uh, when, someone, when, when, when his advisors weren't quick to give him the answer he wanted, he was going to tear them limb from limb and make their houses a dunghill. He didn't mess around. He was, you know, no committees there. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar did his analysis and decided the optimum size of a committee was seven-tenths of a member. And uh, so he's a tough guy. And it's interesting here, even we find that even hinted at behind the thing here where the Lord is telling Zedekiah, you're, no, you're not going to escape, but you're going to have to face him eyeball to eyeball. And, and, and that's uh, uh, kind of interesting. Um, it says, uh, Thou shalt behold the eyes of the king of Babylon. Uh, uh, that's kind of interesting. You, you might just pause here, for, put your finger here, and turn to Ezekiel 12. I think I call, call this to your attention before, but it's a good place to, to remind you about it. Um, Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 13. Ezekiel is writing, now Ezekiel's in captivity from the uh, first or second siege. I think it's the first siege, but I, I've forgotten. In any case, Ezekiel is a captive in Babylon. He's also writing. But he has a prophecy in Ezekiel 12, verse 13. He says, My net, God says to Ezekiel, My net will I also spread upon him, speaking of Zedekiah. And he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he shall die there. And um, you're probably wondering what that's all about. You might turn to Jeremiah 52. We'll peek ahead at Jeremiah, chapter 52, the last chapter in the book of Jeremiah. Pick it up about verse 10, which uh, details chronologically or in, in narrative form what happens when Zedekiah is finally apprehended by the king of Babylon. It says, verse 10, the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. Okay. Also, all the princes of Judah in Riblah. Verse 11, then he put out the eyes of Zedekiah. And the king of Babylon bound him in chains and carried him to Babylon and put him in prison till the day of his death. So that was Zedekiah's destiny. A natural death, in effect, but in prison, blinded, uh, having the last seen, last conscious vision was of the Babylonians slaughtering his sons before they put out his eyes. Zedekiah did, I mean, uh, Nebuchadnezzar played rough. Okay, back to chapter... 34, verse 4, Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus saith the Lord uh, of thee, Thou shalt not die by the sword, but thou shalt die in peace. And with the uh, burnings of thy fathers and the former kings who were before thee, so shall they burn odors for thee. And they will uh, lament thee, saying, O Lord, for I have pronounced the word, saith the Lord. One small point. Some people read this and assume they're talking about cremation. 
And it's just a historical point. You'll find that the cremation was not the norm at all in the history of Israel. Uh, it was not, the, not normally practiced. They, you will f- find burnings referred to, like here and several other places. But what they did is they burned spices. You'll find Second Chronicles 16 and Second Chronicles 21 are places where that uh, happens to uh, occur. Uh, no big deal, but I thought I'd just mention that. Oh, only, you will find certain places where they, the Jews practice cremation, and that's where they were uh, especially fearful of the bodies being desecrated. And the concept was is that if they burned the body, they couldn't do anything more to them. There was a couple of places in their history where you'll find that. But in general, cremation is, is not practiced by the Jews, on the one hand. On the other hand, I've heard Chuck uh, speak many times that there's, you know, once your spirit has left the body, then... Uh, it's really irrelevant what they do to it. It will not in any way impede the Lord's ability to resurrect you, so it's not a big issue one way or the other. Uh, verse 6, and then, then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words unto Zedekiah, king of Judah in Jerusalem. When the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left against Lashish and against Azekah, for these fortified, uh, fortified cities remained of the cities of Judah. These two cities are southwest of, Jeru- of Jerusalem. Lashish, about 35 miles southwest, and Azekah, about 15 miles southwest. Um, Lashish is now Tel Ed Duir, and the other one is Tel Ez Zechariah, I guess. And uh, the, um, the Lashish letters uh, make give vivid descriptions of all of this, by the way. But this is about the southern extent of, 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 the, of the siege, if you will, of, of the land of Judah. No big deal, but just a little background. Okay, now we're going into a passage in chapter 34 that requires a little background. Um, and to, to get a perspective of this, it might be useful to acquaint, since you and I are not generally used to slave trade, uh, and you need to understand some of the laws. So you might turn to Exodus 21. We'll just take a quick summary, a quick cram course on the on the on the comments about uh, on the Torah, comments about um, keeping slaves. The first 11 verses of chapter 21 of Exodus. <clears throat> It says, Now these are the ordinances which thou shalt shut before them. If thou, if thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he was married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, then sh- and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be the masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall uh, plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door and unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore uh, his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. And it goes on with some other things. Um, Some interesting rules about keeping slaves. And you all know about the doorpost, the concept of a bond slave, which has been a slave for life, not for any six-year kind of period. Um, you might just to pick up the, do another survey. Leviticus 25 also deals with the law of slaves. Leviticus 25, picking it up about verse um, 39. If thy brother who dwelleth by thee hath become poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a slave, but as a hired servant, and as a sojourner he shall be with thee, and he shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. Unto the year of Jubilee. Now, in this case, it's a little different. This is where a guy is indenturing himself to pay off a debt. And then uh, what that, that can only go to the year of Jubilee. Every, uh, every seventh year was, this, was a Sabbath year. And after seven weeks of Sabbath years, after 49 years, in other words, you had a Jubilee year. And, the, and you could not uh, indenture yourself beyond the boundary of a Jubilee year. And in verse 41, Then shall he depart from thee, he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family and unto his possession of his fathers. And there's, there's rules about this kind of a slave. Okay? And then if we pop over to Deuteronomy 15, Deuteronomy 15, again, verse 12, And if thy brother... Deuteronomy 15, verse 12, and the general pa- passage here is about the um, Sabbath year. If, uh, if thy brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee, serve thee six years, but in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. When thou sendest him out from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty, but you've, you know, 
furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy uh, out of thy floor that is a thrashing floor and out of thy wine press of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee thou shalt give unto him and thou shalt remember that thou wast a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord thy God redeemed thee before I command thee this day now you notice a link here the law of the slave was linked to the fact that they were slaves in Egypt and God redeemed them so they're not to abuse the slaves uh, it's going to be kind of interesting. We're going to see shortly here. If, if we were to do a survey of this, we would discover that the 8th century prophets, Isaiah, Micah, Hosea, and Amos, four of them, have special passages telling them not to, uh, to do social injustice to their slaves. The fact that they were indentured in servitude was no reason to abuse them. And again, the, the link of their own history being born out of, the nation of Israel said to be born out of, Egypt from the Exodus. So from that root, they should be particularly sensitive to uh, the slave rules. Now, what we're going to discover is nobody paid attention to the law. We've just been through some 30-odd chapters of Jeremiah. We have a pretty good perspective of how rigorous Judah was observing God's rules. And it's no surprise then to us that they were abusing this. Now, the place is under siege, and they're about they recognize the place is about to go down. Now, there's nothing like, you know, a terminal countdown to bring them all to repentance, you know. Um, so, with the ta- city going to go down, there is for a little while a commitment by them to get their act together and repent. Notice what happens. Verse uh, we're down in chapter 34 of Jeremiah, verse eight. We got down to verse seven, verse eight. This is the word that came unto Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them, that every man should let his manservant and every man his maidservant, being an Hebrew or a Hebrewess, go free, that none should enslave them, to wit, a Jew and his brother. Now, if you just read that, you wouldn't quite understand what's going on, but you need to recognize that there were rules under which they were to be set free, not necessarily right then, but the point is they obviously had abused all these other limitations, served more than six years. They weren't even observing the the Jubilee year, to the best of our records. So they were in in violation of of the Torah, in violation of the law relative to slaves. Now, it's interesting here is that Zedekiah had the uh, people of Judah covenant to let them all go, which they do for a little while. Now, what, what's not obvious here, and I forget whether it's in this passage or elsewhere, but what happens is, the, see, the city of Jerusalem's under siege. The Babylonian army's out there, and it's about to get them. So they're suddenly becoming very pious. I think it's, you know, a panic pious or something, see? <laughs> what happens is the Babylonians fold up their tents and leave for a while. The, 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 the house of Judah figures, gee, they're abandoning their siege. no. They just go back because they went to meet uh, Pharaoh Nehofra on some other issues, so they temporarily retired from the siege. They're going to be back, okay? When they retire, these guys renege on their covenant. Isn't that something? And and that's what's going to come up here. They they made a covenant to release them. They were in default anyway. Then they promised to straighten it out. Once the threat's gone, they say, next to that, they force them back into labor. And God is offended by that. And we're going to see some words about that here in chapter 34. These people... Anyway, they make this covenant. Zedekiah has them make the covenant. They're going to free up the uh, Hebrews that are in a form of servitude. Then verse 10. Now when all the princes and all the people who had entered into the covenant heard that everyone should let his manservant and everyone his maidservant go free, that none should enslave them anymore, then they obeyed and let them go. But afterward they turned, that is, they repented, and caused the servants and the handmaids whom they had let go free to return and brought them into subjection for servants and for handmaids. In other words, they reneged on their deal. They made a solemn covenant before the king that they're going to turn them loose. But after they did that, they changed their mind. Now you can imagine the morale problem around that part of town. Therefore, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying. Notice the reference. See, it's not just a casual remark. He's making specific reference to their own origin and the fact that he made a covenant. God keeps his covenants. 
at the end of seven years, let ye every man uh, his brother and a Hebrew who hath been sold unto thee, and when he hath served thee six years, thou shalt let him go free from there. But your fathers hearken not unto me, neither inclined their ear. And ye were now turned, and had done right in my sight, in proclaiming liberty to every man and his neighbor. And ye had made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Apparently Zedekiah had this covenant ratified in the temple. God honored it. Now they reneged. Verse 16, But ye turned and polluted my name. See, that's the problem. When they make a covenant before the Lord and then don't keep it, they pollute God's name. That's what makes vows so dangerous. Don't make vows. Don't make vows. Resolve to do things, but don't make vows. Because you're not going to keep them. And when you don't keep them, you uh, pollute the name of God. He, he turned and polluted my name and caused every man his servant and every man his handmaid, whom ye had set at liberty at their pleasure, to return and brought them into subjection to be unto you for servants and for handmaids. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine, and I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and passed between these parts. Now, you probably are wondering, what's that all about? It's very interesting. We're going to look shortly at a, a scriptural example in Genesis, but I might mention that the Assyrian inscriptions make reference to a practice, an ancient, ancient practice, that if you and I were going to make an agreement, we would take an animal, typically one that's offered for an offering, and we'd cut it in pieces and set the pieces aside, and then we'd pass between them, you and I, if we were making an agreement. And so if we go between the pieces, uh, that seals the covenant. That's a practice you and I aren't too familiar with. The idea in the Assyrian inscriptions is that if then we break the covenant, we'll be cut in pieces. In other words, if, if after passing through the pieces, if we don't keep that covenant, then we'll be cut in pieces like those pieces. That's, that's the expression that occurs in the Assyrian covenant. So it's a symbolic act, just like, you know, we in, in business... Um, shake hands on a deal, right? We make a certain gesture to seal a bargain, right? I won't tell you why that has to do with the raising of a visor on armor in the days of chivalry. That's a whole other story. But the point is, out of these things, a gesture occurs to seal the bargain. When Boaz seals his redemption act in the cha Ruth chapter 4, right? The guy, the, the guy that does, refuses to do the kinsman part hands Boaz his shoe, well, it turns out in the early days of Israel that when a, a, a widow put upon a kinsman to do the kinsman's part, he didn't have to, but if he didn't, he was disgraced. So if he did the kinsman's part, the take her to wife to raise up seed to the dead brother or, or, or and take the land, whatever, if he did that, great. If he didn't do that, she was to um, spit on him, and he hands her his shoe as a, as a testimony of disgrace. So that was his... You know, he still didn't have to do it, but at least he had this... Thing. And obviously, over time, that becomes just a gesture. No longer carries that stigma. So when this uh, uh, near kinsman uh, d tells Boaz he can't follow through, he hands him his shoe as a gesture, and that, uh, uh, that shoe, of course, becomes for uh, Boaz a marriage license. And you can make a whole thing about shoes because the shoes don't wear out in the, in the watering in the wilderness. And, and John the Baptist's identity with Jesus is that he's not entitled to unlatch his shoe. You can make a whole thing with shoes, and I won't do that here. The point, is, the point is, is that there are these gestures. And you and I still have a handshake thing in the Western culture that comes out of, out of the uh, trust that goes by uh, taking off the helmet or later on just raising the visor. And it becomes a, a gesture of a salute and finally a handshake. And... Um, so we have that gesture. But in the ancient uh, Middle East cultures, that goes way, way back, they have this tradition of making a covenant by cutting the pieces and passing between them. And there is an example of that, rather dramatic, very important example of that, that we'll take a quick look at in Genesis 15. And we're taking a look at that, not that we're interested in the mechanisms, but to be aware of the fact that God entered into such a covenant with Abraham. 
Very important covenant. Genesis 15. Very strange uh, thing occurs in Genesis 15. Uh, Abraham has not had his name changed yet. And uh, we'll pick it up about, oh, verse maybe... God says in verse 7, I am the Lord who brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give you this land and inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? How do I know? You know, it sounds a little impudent at first. But the Lord said to him, Okay, take me a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Right? And he took unto them all of these and divided them in the midst and laid thee one piece against another. But the birds he didn't divide. They're too small. But he divided these things, right? And when the fowls came down upon the sea, they're, they're there, they're a while. It doesn't happen right away. A long time goes by. He's got all this meat around, right? And the birds are starting to pester it. And Abraham is waving them away, trying to preserve this. Right? Abraham drove them away. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. The only place you find that elsewhere in the Scripture is Adam. Okay? That's intentional. And to lo, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon Abraham. On Abram. And he said unto Abram, Know for a surety that thy seed shall be a sojourner in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. He's speaking of, he's forecasting here the uh, sojourn in Egypt, right? They'll come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come here again, and before the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Very interesting remark. The conquest of the land by Joshua wasn't just that Israel wasn't ready earlier. It's that the Amorites weren't through sinning yet. God, had his, for his purposes, had their timing was full when Joshua moved in. Verse 17. Here's the key thing. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace. In other words, visualize a floating sort of smoke pot lantern kind of thing. A smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. Right? And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying unto thee, and so forth. He gives the covenant here unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt to the great river Euphrates. The Kenites, we're going to come back to the Kenites, by the way, and the Kenizzites and the Kadamites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaim and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gergesites and the Jebusites. And all that land. He covenants with Abraham. Now, what's interesting here is the pieces. Who passes through the pieces? Does Abraham? No, because he's asleep. In fact, the whole thing is somewhat the nature of a vision here. Who passes between the pieces? God only. Is there anything Abraham could do to break the covenant? No. This is one of those very important unconditional covenants. A very important issue. Now, it's also into what is... By the way, I skipped one thing I took for granted. The smoke, the, the, the smoke and the fire. What is that? What's another name for that? The Shekinah. The Shekinah glory. And uh, we'll, Moses will see that in the wilderness. But that's, what, four generations later. Again, it's the, the glory of God. Now, why the, why, just a small point, why these peculiar pieces? We've got, a, we've got a, a heifer three years old, a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and turtle dove and pigeon. Why those things? They're later going to be ordained under the Levitical sacrifices as offerings. They're not yet. This is Abraham, right? Near as we can tell. Now, they may, have been, they may have been ordained in Eden. We don't know that. And just re-ratified in the law of Moses. That's a whole other theory. Point is, though, what do they point to? The ox, servant, right? The goat, sinners. Sin, sin offering. And Matthew 25, sheep and the goats. What are the goats? The sinners. Here is a servant, someone who is made sin, substitutionary, and the ram of consecration. And, of course, turtle dove and pigeon of terms of love, sorrow, resurrection, take your pick. Who, are the, who, who is anticipated in this offering? Jesus Christ, you betcha. How long did he have his ministry? Three years. How old were these things? Interesting, isn't it? Proves that Genesis was written after the, the gospel. 
apply the pr principles of textual criticism that has to be written after the book of Matthew. I'm being flippant, of course. Main point, though, there's no pledge extracted from Abram. This is an act of offering, of commitment, pure grace. Pure grace to Abraham. Now, the Hebrews have a phrase, he cut a covenant. If I make a commitment to you, if we cut a deal, you've heard that expression? Cut a covenant that comes from this. Okay? Now, I don't know if the military expression cutting orders is the same thing, but we, speak, we speak, say, say in business anything, we're going to cut a deal. What do you mean cut a deal? You mean like a deck of cards? No. Like, like Genesis 15. Except most covenants are like the one here made with in Jeremiah with the parties passing between the pieces. And that's apparently what they did under the authority of King Zedekiah. Because God here indicts them for not keeping the covenant. And he says in verse 18, I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant, which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between the pieces. See, they apparently entered into a covenant to let the slaves go free. And then they blew it. So God isn't going to let that go. He doesn't wink at that. He, uh, he deals with it. The princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life and their dead bodies shall be food unto the fowls of heaven and to the beasts of the earth. Who's going to get cut in pieces? The ones that didn't keep the covenant. Tough stuff. Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princes will I give unto the hands of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life and into the hand of the king of Babylon's army who are gone up from you. Behold, I will command, saith the Lord, and cause them to return to the city, and they shall fight against it and take it and burn it with fire, and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without an inhabitant. In other words, he's going to command them to come back. They've gone for a while. And the princes of Judah have assumed they're gone. He says, oh, I'm going to command them to come back, and they're going to clean your cage, guys. Okay. Well, that's sort of what he says. Um, chapter 35. Sure, we can make 35. No problem. Okay. Chapter 35 is a strange chapter for a couple of reasons. We're going to be introduced to a strange collection of people, the Rechabites. And we don't know a lot about them, but we know a little bit, and it's going to be kind of interesting. But also what's strange is chapter 35 is out of place. What happens in chapter 35 takes place 17 years earlier. And you sort of, you know, what some scholars, it's very amusing to me, you know, a lot of scholars say, gee, this, the book of Jeremiah is kind of a hodgepodge of pieces. It's not in chronological order. And in some cases, it just happens to be that way, apparently. But in this case... We're going to discover before it's through, your sort of your, your final exam question is, uh, why is chapter 35 inserted here? And there's some very interesting reasons for it. But it's not here chronologically. It's not here in any logical sense, except the Holy Spirit, I submit to you, had a very special reason for putting this particular chapter right here, even though it has nothing to do with the chronology we've been dealing with. Now, and we'll unravel that as we go. First of all, well, it says, The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, chapter 35, verse 1. Uh, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah. See, we've been reading about Zedekiah, the last king. This, we're going all the way back to Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, where a peculiar incident occurs. He says, Go into the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them into the house of the Lord into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. And I took um, Jezaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, and his brethren and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites, and I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the sons of Icadalia, the man of God, who was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Messiah, or something such thing, and the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I set before them the sons of the house of the Rechabites, pots full of wine and cups, and said to them, Drink wine. But they said, We will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever, neither build ye a house, and so forth. I'll go into this. At this point, I better stop and give you a little background. And then we'll pick it up. 
Uh, the Rechabites are a strange separatist nomadic group. Our uh, descendants of Jonadab or Jehonadab about, uh, shows up in about 840 B.C. You'll find his story in Second Kings chapter 10. And uh, Jonadab or Jehonadab is actually quite helpful uh, in the days of uh, Jehu in ridding the northern kingdom of Baal worship. Jehu was a pretty rough king, and Jonadab helped them purge the land of, of idols. So he's a good guy. Now, he is a Kenite. Now, Kenites, we don't know a lot about the Kenites. What we do know, they apparently were a sub, they're somehow associated with the Midianites, a subgroup maybe of the Midianites, because we know that their kindred, uh, that Jethro was of them. Jethro was Moses' father-in-law. Remember when Moses left Egypt and he, he uh, lives in Midian for a while and, and, and takes Ivan de Carlo to wife? Well, <laughs> Jethro... I just want to see if you're paying attention. Um, Jethro was a Kenite, okay? And, and uh, so he's, it's not an Israeli, it's not a, it's not a, a Hebrew sect or, a, or a tribe, if you will. Now, at the time of Jethro, as I say, they were, they were very prominent in purging uh, the, uh, the um, northern kingdom of Baal worship. I wrote this down around the time of Jehu, excuse me, not, not Jethro, at the time of Jehu. Um, a guy by the name of Heber, who's a Kenite, and his wife, Jael, J-A-E-L. Um, this was a time when there was, Israel was at war with the uh, Canaanites, and uh, Sisera was the, the big ruler. He tried to hide in Jael's tent, take refuge, and she killed him. And that's a very important uh, thing in, in the defeat there, and, the, and uh, to rid the land of Baal worship. So the Kenites, even though they're not... Um, uh, Hebrew, they were helpful in helping the land get purged of, of, of uh, idols. They generally lived in the southern deserts, according to 1 Samuel 15, 6, and, um, and in Israelite territory as in Judges chapter 4 and Judges chapter 5, we find reference. They're a very mysterious group. We don't know a lot about them. Now, at the time that the northern kingdom, which did return to idolatry and then gets, goes into... When it finally fell the Kenites moved south. So we do get the impression they're faithful to the God of Israel, even though they're not Hebrews. They're somehow assimilated into Israel, even though they don't have ethnic uh, roots there. So they move south into Judah. Now, they have a major leader, about 840 B.C., called Jonadab, and um, he is the one that gave them some rules. His, his uh, positioning of them was to be a nomadic tribe and not to do anything that interfered with being a nomadic tribe. Therefore, they did not build houses. They lived in tents where they could move. They did not raise wine. They didn't raise any kind of crops that you can't... I mean, nomadic tribes don't do that. We're going to find a lot of misunderstandings have come out of this because it sounds like wine is bad. And that's a whole other issue I'm not going to get into tonight. But recognize that the main thing here is that Jonadab gave them all kinds of rules incident to them uh, maintaining a nomadic existence. He banned all sedentary occupations. Now, what's interesting is the Rechabites, some three, for 300 years, were faithful to Jonadab's instruction. Okay? Their patriarch was uh, Jonadab. And uh, here you see what Jehoiakim Kim does. He invites the current Rechabites into, the, into uh, the house here, house of the Lord, and he gives them uh, pots full of wine and cups and says, hey, drink some wine. And in, this, in verse 6 they said, we will drink no wine for Jonadab. Now this is 300 years ago. Jonadab said, uh, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Now don't jump to the conclusion of something wrong. Don't base any temperance on this. So many people do. This is it's misconstruing what's really going on. Neither shall ye build a house. Anything wrong with building houses? No, but that was their instruction, not to build a house. Nor sow seed. Nor plant vineyards. Nor have any. But all your ways ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye are sojourners. Now, this, uh, I'm not saying this vice isn't good. Our citizenship is in heaven. We should have a very light touch with the things of this world. Verse 8, Thus 
They say, Thus we have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father. In all that he hath charged us to drink no wine in all our days, we and our wives and our sons and our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in, neither have we a vineyard, nor a field, nor seed. Okay? Nothing wrong with raising wheat, is there? For them it is, because they were instructed not to by their forebear. Verse 10. But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. Verse 11, But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon came up into the land that we said, Come, let us go down to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for the fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. In other words, they are not city people. They're analogous, I think, to the Bedouins or something in the sense that they're nomadic tribe, tent-dwelling tribesmen. They retreated to the city because of the pressures of war. They're not normally in the city and that's where they find themselves here. Verse 12, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my word, saith the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed, for unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. And I have sent also unto you all my servants and the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return now, every man, from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given you unto your fathers, and ye have not inclined your ear nor hearkened unto me. See what the Lord is doing? He's drawing a contrast. Here's this strange nomadic mystery group. But they're faithful to the voice of their instructor. The Lord is not making an issue of the wine. He's making an issue of their faithfulness to their prophet. He's in contrast. He's, he's contrasting himself and Judah. Verse 16, Because the sons of Jonadab and the sons of Rechab have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people hath not hearkened unto me, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard. And I have called unto them, but they have not answered. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according to all that he hath commanded you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not lack a man to stand before me forever. Isn't that interesting? What's really going on here? Well, one reference I'd like to just throw at you is Isaiah chapter 1, the second and third verses of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah the verses 2 and 3 of the book of Isaiah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Isaiah chapter uh, 1, verse 3. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know my people doth not consider. Interesting. Every time, how many of you have pets? Every time your pet recognizes you and responds to you, remember Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3. Because our Lord's frustration, if I can use that word, is that the ox knoweth his master... Right? And the ass knows his master's feeding trough, right? But Israel doesn't know the Lord. And every time you see your pet or a, a dumb beast acknowledge his owner, remind yourself if he's, make sure he's not doing more than you are. Okay? Now that's what the Lord is saying here in my mind in terms of, that's why I'm very intrigued with the positioning of. Chapter 35, and this whole issue of the Rechabites. It's got nothing to do with the story. It's going back 17 years in the days of Jehoiakim. However, what's the contrast? The princes of Judah, who didn't keep the covenant, 
They swore a covenant and didn't keep it. Uh, Now, there are at least five contrasts here. The Rechabites followed a fallible leader. Jonadab was, hey, you know, human, right? Judah disobeyed the eternal God. Contrast. Jonadab gave his commandments once. He laid down the law for the Rechabites. Hey, you guys are going to stay in tents, you're going to stay mobile, no sedentary occupations, therefore no vineyards, no crops, no seed, no houses that you build, etc. Right? He, he put down his rules once. How often did God put down his rules? Repeatedly. God makes that point in verse 15. Again and again and again, he says, I have sent also you all my servants and my prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell safely in the land which I have given you and to your fathers. And you. But ye have not inclined your ear. Not once, again and again and again. His patience is exhausted. It's interesting that uh, the, the Rechabites had their restrictions only on temporal issues. We have no evidence that there's any profound spiritual issue there. Just the idea that they have a specific set of rules to deal with their physical life, their, their, their temporal issues. God's rules are on both. There are some temporal issues, but obviously they are all eternal issues. Now, um, again, the Lord's people, how often did they disobey? Continually. For hundreds of years. The whole nation, history of the nation of Israel, really. Right? The Rechabites obeyed 300 years. See the contrast again. And, of course, the final contrast is the Rechabites' fidelity to their leader is rewarded. And, of course, the disloyalty of Judah is punished. The, the uh, contrast of chapter 34 and the failure of Judah to keep their vow, and, and uh, chapter 35, the Reca- Rechabites are putting in there as a uh, contrast. Now, there's another issue here that causes a lot of puzzling here because verse 19, see this whole Rechabites thing, I'm really summarizing a lot of background because it's a mystery. We don't know a lot about these people. They keep surfacing in odd little places throughout the Scripture. Um, But uh, verse 19, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, uh, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not lack a man to stand before me forever. God is saying that the descendants of Jonadab, that is the Rechabites, are going to be before the throne of grace forever. Well, that raises all kinds of questions. Um, This question of stand before me or serve me uh, typically is implied to mean a priesthood. However, it actually is used of the prophets in 1 Kings 17.1. It's used of the priests in Numbers 16.9. And it's used of kings, 1 Kings 10.8. So what exactly is meant by a Rechabite standing before the Lord forever is not that clear. The term is also used of uh, patriarchs in Genesis 19.27, of Moses and Samuel both in Jeremiah 15.1, and it's, of, uh, it's also used of the nation, uh, when they were worshiping the Lord, that is, in Jeremiah 7, chapter 7. So it's uh, uh, exactly what this means is a little unclear because I'm not sure we'd know a Rechabite today if we saw one, but apparently they are, in fact, destined to uh, stand before the Lord. Now, there is a strange passage in the Targum, one of the Jewish commentaries, which implies that the Rechabites were somehow incorporated into the tribe of Levi. Now, that's not scripture. We don't know that for sure. It's just one of these, again, one of these mysterious little pieces of background that uh, uh, I... Uh, I share with you. Okay, so we're doing pretty good. We can probably uh, create a little more damage tonight. Just knock these things off and and keep moving here. Um, In general, so much of Jeremiah's message, I think, is uh, familiar to us in in large measure, so I won't badger that to death, and I'll just try to throw in a few things from background that might be useful. Uh, But I think something else you should understand is that Jeremiah's book was written twice, and we'll see why in chapter 36. Chapter 36, verse 1, It came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a scroll of a book, and write it in all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations, from the day I spoke unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. 
So in other words, the whole bit, right, Jeremiah? Write it all down. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah. And this guy shows up again. Remember, he was the trustee on the, on the title deeds last week, right? Same guy. Uh, Baruch, the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which uh, he had spoken unto him upon a scroll of a book. Now, this is very common practice in those days to have an amanuensis, a scribe, a, a dictation, a special uh, skill. Verse 5, And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am restrained, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore go and read in the scroll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the hearing of the people in the house upon the fast day. And thou, sh uh, and thou shalt read them in the hearing of all Judah who come out of their cities. And it may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return every one from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord hath promised against his people. And Baruch, the son of Nera, did according to all that uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, commanded him, reading in the book uh, the, the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. So they're getting a full dose of Jeremiah's presentation in their hearing. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord and all the people in Jerusalem to all the people who came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. Then read Baruch in the um, book the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of uh, uh, Gemariah, the son of uh, Shaphan the scribe, in the higher court at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house in the hearing of all the people. And when Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, had heard out of the book all the words of the Lord, then he went down into the king's house, into the scribe's chambers, and lo, all the princes sat there, even Elishama the scribe and Delia the son of a lot of other names I can't pronounce properly. Um, this whole gang of characters. And Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all the princes. Verse 13, And Micaiah declared unto them all the words that he had heard, and Baruch took the book in the hearing of the people. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudai, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shemeliah, the son of Cushi, unto Baruch, saying, Take in thy hand the scroll from which thou hast read in the hearing of the people, and come. So Baruch, uh, the son of Neriah, took the scroll and came uh, in his hand and came unto them, and they said to him, Sit down now and read it in our hearing. So Baruch read it in their hearing. Okay. And it came to pass... When they had heard all the words, they turned in fear one to another. And they said unto Baruch, We will surely tell the king all these words. And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? And Baruch answered them, He pronounced all these words into me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. There's the technical explanation of how that happened. Verse, <laughs> verse 19. Then said the princes unto Baruch, Go hide thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye are. Hot stuff, huh? And they went into the king, into the court, and they laid up the scroll in the chamber of Elisha, the scribe, and told all the words in the hearing of the king. So the king sent uh, Jehudai to fetch uh, the scroll, and he took it out of the... Uh, out of Elisha of the scribe's chamber. Jehudai read it in the hearing of the king and the hearing of all the princes who stood before the king. And now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire in the hearth burning before him. You start to see it coming, can't you? We're going to have the first example of textual criticism in the history of biblical literature. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four columns... Bear in mind, you can visualize this as a scroll, and they write in columns. If you've never seen the Dead Sea Scrolls or whatever, in the, or any of those things, you, you can visualize this. He read three or four columns, which are equivalent to pages, if you were doing a codex, as we would call it. Okay. Um, he cut it with the penknife. Okay. This is called textual criticism. You cut out the parts you don't agree with. Right? <laughs> right? and cast it into the fire that was in the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Boy. Yet they were not afraid, nor tore their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. Nevertheless, uh, Elnathan and uh, 
couple of these other guys, uh, had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the scroll, but he would not hear them. And the king commanded uh, Jeremiel, the son of Hamelech, and uh, a couple of these other guys, uh, to take Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord hid them. So, uh, bad stuff, burning books. Especially in this context, uh, they could not do worse. Um, that, uh, that sealed it. They had their chance. Verse 27. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after the king had burned the scroll, and the words which Baruch uh, wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another scroll, and write it in all the former words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim the king of Judah hath burned. And thou shalt say unto Jehoiakim king of Judah, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast burned this scroll, saying, Why hast thou written in it, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease in it man and beast. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, king, the king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David. And his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat and in the night to the frost. Bear in mind, here see, he's going to be denied a king's burial. Even being a denied a burial was a, a, a fearsome thing to a Jew. And the king to be denied a royal burial is, is uh, yeah, obviously a... a deeper form of indictment. Verse 31, And I will punish him with his seed and his servants for their iniquity. And I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have pronounced against them, but they hearken not. Then took Jeremiah another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neria, who wrote in it from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, the son of the king of Judah, hath burned in the fire, and they were added besides unto them many like words. Heavy stuff. Okay. And I don't want to get into 37 tonight because I won't do it justice. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.